and welcome to another episode of Seeds of Music. I'm your host, Kyle Williams, and this is the only awesome web show where aspiring musicians can learn right now how to find their market and effectively grow as an independent artist or producer. Even if you don't consider yourself a serious musician in these interviews, there's a lot of great tips and insights that are going to help you enjoy your hobby even more. And you can even apply these lessons in any situation, any vocation to be more creative, reach your goals, and do what you love every day. Today on the show, we have with us Dylan Evans, who is the program director for uncollege.org. Now, what is Uncollege? It's a social movement that is replacing college with self-directed learning in order to create academic deviance. Dylan and I are going to talk about hacking this idea of hacking your education and the advantages that that has over traditional schooling because I know there are a lot of musicians or who have made great careers and are legendary who may have never gone to formal schooling for music and then there are some that have so I know it's a confusing question and an expensive question for a lot of musicians out there about whether or not they should go to college and, and learn music so what we're going to talk about here with Dylan is an alternative to that you know a way to really learn how to self-direct your own learning and hack your music education and we all know the biggest advantage of that is going to be saving a lot of money but there's a lot of other advantages to that in more so let's jump right into it okay guys welcome to another episode of seeds of music we have uh dylan evans on the show uh, program director of uncollege thanks for coming on dylan thanks for having me on oh excellent um this guy has led a really interesting life um i had a ton of questions that i prepared but we've only have them for a limited amount of time so Let's get straight into the meat of it. Um, so, uh, Dylan, you know what? I've you know I've been following on college for a little bit, and there's this this concept of an educational deviant. What exactly is that? Well, I love this phrase. I mean, this was one of the phrases that uh, really drew me to on college when I first heard Dale Stevens uh, talk about on college um, last year, and when he used this phrase, I kind of thought. You know, this really speaks to me. I feel I am an educational deviant. So it's, I guess, for me, it means someone who's passionate about learning, uh, but who does it often in unconventional ways, and maybe has a kind of um, love-hate relationship with the educational institutions. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of what it means for me. Yeah, love-hate. Yeah, I can, I, I can relate to that because you know, there's a lot of money spent and. There's a lot of time spent, and then you're kind of thrust into this this world that uh, most people have a college degree, and and it doesn't, you know, you're not so sure if it's really really helped you out. So I can definitely relate to that. Um, but on college, you know, it's seems about it's you know about hacking your education. So what what advantage does this have over traditional schooling? Well, I think it's um, it's something that certain people have always done and it's not necessarily for everyone but it represents a, a very sort of proactive uh, way of approaching learning so that you rather than asking other people to organize learning for you and give you a curriculum and deliver the content you really put together your own education in the same way that you know hackers will build their own machines yeah, rather yeah. than just buying a machine off the shelf uh, someone who's hacking their education will put together their own learning by taking bits and pieces from anything you know a second hand textbook they find uh, at a bookstore uh, an online course offered by some university um, some a group of friends that might get together and uh, organize uh, study sessions, going to the odd conference, just being a kind of magpie, if you like, and putting to picking whatever you uh, feel is necessary to help yourself learn whatever you're focused on. Okay. And it, does it take like a specific type of person? I mean, do you have, you have to have it built in your genes or can you um, actually learn how to act, hack your education with enough motivation? 
Yeah, I think it is about motivation. If you've got the, I think that's the key thing. If you, it's not you don't have to be some kind of Rain Man genius to to be a, a you know hack your education. You just have to be passionate. Oh, Matt Damon, about it. Goodwill Hunting. Oh, <laughs> no, you, I think really it's uh, you, you know it often does attract bright people, but not you don't have to be bright. The reason it often attracts bright people is because they often find themselves bored by college yeah. um, because it's not really stretching them. Yeah. But really what matters is, you know, passion for learning and your uh, desire to do things your own way. Someone who maybe is a bit, uh, sometimes, you know, these people can often get into trouble at school, even if they are bright, because they just feel frustrated with having to do things the way, yeah. the same way as everyone else. Look, everyone's mind is different, so why yeah. should we all be forced to learn the same way? Yeah, and do you think this would apply to you know, musicians as well, musicians as well, because, you know, musicians, we, there's lots of things we have to learn, like music theory, uh, your principal instrument, you also have to learn basic piano, and, you know, in the college environment, there's, you know, you have the chance to network with other musicians and meet with professors, but, you know, would this apply to a musician as well? I mean, could a musician really hack their music education? Yeah, well, I was thinking about that, uh, obviously, in relation to this interview, and I think, you uh, Absolutely, uh, it applies to musicians as well, and in the in the same way that you know, it's hacking your education in general is not for everyone. So hacking a kind of music education wouldn't be for everyone. But look, the history of music is uh, full of people who have been self-taught and who've gone unconventional routes, yeah. as well as people who've gone more conventional. Uh, but you know, the whole idea of modern music education isn't really. Uh, that old of music schools and uh, you know conservatoires and stuff like that. So yeah. maybe 150 years old, something like that. Okay. So uh, you know, the, uh, it has become very much institutionalized now. That is the recognized way to go if you want to succeed. But yeah. there are always interesting stories of people who do things differently, uh, especially maybe in the world of more less so much I guess in the world of classical music. Although you do still find them even there. Yeah, but more in the world of popular music, people who, and especially nowadays with say electronic music, yeah. I think uh, it's very much a hands-on hacker spirit. I mean, just to give you an example of that. My um, my sister has been desperate to get into DJing for years, okay. and I keep I I was saying to her, you know, every year, just buy some decks, buy some. Because you DJ, you DJ, right? I. Yeah, right. Yeah. I've been DJing for years, and I didn't, you know, you know, I never took a course in it. No DJ I haven't, I've known has ever taken any yeah. classes in DJing. They offer them, but I don't know anybody who has. <laughs> right, you see them offered all over the place, and but, and my sister though was like, oh, I've got to take a course, and so eventually, you know, she signed up for some course that wasn't right. It was in music production rather than DJing, mm. and you know, finally, finally, just last year, I persuaded her finally to actually buy some actual hardware. And do some mixing, and now she and and she loves it now. She's but it, you know, it it took her a long time to sort of think, I maybe I can teach myself. Yeah, I don't have to get someone to actually teach me. Yeah, and I think it's that making that switch into that different mindset um, that come is easier for some people and maybe harder for others because we yeah. some people are more used to just saying, All right, I've got to you know if you want to learn something, you have to have a teacher. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of musicians, uh, you know, just don't have the money to go to learn music at, you know, in the college level. Some, you know, you can learn at a smaller, like, you know, state college or four-year university, and it might not be as expensive as somewhere like Berkeley. But I know, at least for me, like, I don't have the money to do that, so I have to add, have to hack uh, all of my music education. And so I can say from a first-hand basis, it's definitely is, it definitely is possible. It's something you can learn. Um, but uh, let's move on. Uh, moving on, can you tell us about the Gap Year program? Sure. Well, the Gap Year program is something we are launching with UnCollege this fall, um, so September 2013. And uh, this is going to be our first uh, step into providing a, you know, a long term, a, in this case, it's a year's program for people. And there's a kind of a paradox here because if we're sort of recommending uh, self-directed learning, okay. uh, what are we doing? 
offering a program. You know, it's yeah. kind of like a program for self-directed owners. Well, if you're so self-directed, surely you wouldn't need this program anyway. Well, yeah. So, well, well that's people teach of, to teach. You know, that that seems it, paradoxical or ironic. You know, but it's true. You know? Right. So, I mean, I, but I think of this as a challenge because if we, if these are people who are already, you know, fairly, uh, you know, already have made a good start down the road towards becoming self-directed learners, then we have got to figure out a way of giving them even more skill, you know, even enhancing, taking people who are already pretty good at it and helping them to come even better. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we have been thinking about this a long time. And we, so we've come, we've come up with some novel ideas for doing it, which involve a lot of ideas taken from video games. So how could we, the whole sort of course, if you like, is structured around challenges that people take. They can accumulate points that they level up. They can spend these points on various books. No, it's good because it's a video game generation. <laughs> right. And, but all of these things is, is in the real world. So the challenges are real world challenges that will give you something lasting and valuable uh, that you can actually use when you finish. Not so, like, so if you're writing a term paper in college, you know, you write it for one professor, the professor reads it, and that's it. You know, nobody else will ever read that term paper again. Yeah. And it's kind of a waste in a way. Yeah. So whereas our challenges are things like build a personal website that you can use to showcase your talents. Okay. Um, you know, go and take five entrepreneurs out for coffee and uh, you know, network with them. Oh, um, that's great. That's a great Things idea. like that. So that, you know, these will be things that actually help you and are uh, in a lasting way. And then the points you get by, by completing these challenges, you can spend on goodies that we also um, could be very useful to you, like say a, a guided tour around Google or a, a ticket to a pass to a conference that, or an introduction to a, a hotshot investor or something like yeah. that. So the idea is then that you know it can make it fun, but because it's more based around challenges, people can choose the order in which they pursue the challenges, they pursue them at their own uh, speed, and uh, they can't do everything, so they have to choose which ones they're not going to do, and they have to get, uh, they have to prove that they've done it by blogging about it, taking photographs, videos, and so I think it's kind of, uh, should hopefully appeal to the sort of more independent-minded people, the people who want to study and learn in a semi-structured way, so we're not totally saying just do your own thing. Yeah. There won't be any point in coming on the program otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. But nevertheless, gives them a lot of freedom. So, um, is this something that is applicable not just to people who are looking to accelerate their learning in kind of self-directed way? But um, do you have to have a particular interest? Like, can can independent artists or people who are just want to be songwriters or music producers or DJs? I mean, this is this broad enough for everyone to benefit from? If they come on. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we we're really trying to um, appeal to a wide range of uh, of people. So we don't want everyone who comes on the gap year program to be an aspiring uh, entrepreneur. Yeah. With a, you know, to, yeah. To do a yeah. tech startup. I mean, yeah. we would <laughs> love it if some people were like that. We'd also, but it, you know, we would also really hope that. We get some people with more artistic uh, inclinations, whether it be in music or visual arts or writing or film. Um, and we'd also hope to get some people maybe from a sort of more uh, social entrepreneur type, um, political NGO yeah. type, charity yeah. type, um, yeah, kind of volunteering kind of or orientation as well. And if we kind of get a mix of those three types and maybe some more that I haven't thought of, then it would be great because then people can bounce off each other and, and each person has a different kind of skill set that they can share with the others. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to narrow down exactly, uh, what do, are there any requirements or restrictions on the program? Like can, can someone, is there, like say if you have someone in their late 20s that already finished their college degree. And then we have some people who watch the show who are in their early twenties, you know, and they're thinking about go to college. Obviously, they can go to it. But what about, um, I mean, what about someone who maybe has already finished college? They've already accumulated the debt, and the degree might not have been in their pa passion, or maybe it was in, was in music. I mean, they is there any restriction? On the, the only restriction we've got in terms of age is that we do have an upper age limit of twenty eight, 
and we okay. have uh, and people do we have a lower age limit of 18 for legal reasons but uh, so yeah we uh, but that's a quite a big range it means that you can we can have people who are just finished school and uh, maybe thinking of going to college later yeah. we have some people who have dropped out of college halfway through and are never thinking of going back we have yeah. some people you know, we could have people who've already graduated, and as you say, um, feel that they that they want they didn't really get what they needed from college, and they want to uh, try something different. So, yeah, we'd like again. It's like you have a mix of skills. If you have a mix of ages too, that can I think be okay. be very be very useful. Is there still hope for someone who's past that uh, twenty eight age limit? I think there's, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, I think there's always hope. There's, uh, the question is, you know, do you, are you uh, prepared to um, take a gamble and risk things? Look, a lot of times when people do MBAs, in their nine, in the, they do it, you know, in, in their 30s, mid-30s or later, what they're actually, what they're, what they're really doing is not, you know, getting a... Uh, a business, um, an MBA, because they've got a very defined idea about the way they want their career to go. Yeah. That's the kind of that's the cover story. Uh, for some people, that's true that cover story, but for yeah. other people, it's uh, just a socially sanctioned and legitimate way of taking a year out so that they can rethink their direction and reinvent <laughs> themselves. Right. So it's like. Well, maybe if we could do something like that. Maybe there will be in the future places where you can do that, but you don't have to pay pay a hundred thousand bucks to do it. Right? Uh, yeah. you, and you don't have to go to two years to Harvard to do it. You can just go three months to the reinvent space. Yeah, and you know, and and, and not be ashamed to say that's what I'm doing. I, you know, I've got to the age of thirty. I've done this job. Uh, you know, in some company that I was being, oh, I've enjoyed it. It's great, but I'm I'm not going anywhere new with this job. Yeah. So I want to change direction. I don't know how or where I'm going to go. So maybe we could have more spaces for people like that. We're going to look as people, you know, live longer and the working life gets longer, yeah. retirement gets later and later. People, the whole idea of sticking in one career for your whole working yeah. life is increasingly untenable. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't like that at all. I'm. I'm more into the deferred life plan that you know Timothy Ferris mentioned in the. Absolutely, work, yeah. Timothy you know, Ferris I'm, is a great idea. Yeah. So you know he has this idea of taking mini retirements. Don't yeah. leave your whole retirement until the end of your life. Yeah. Have mini retirement, <laughs> and the, the the same way you could maybe have you know think of like education as well. So before we had education first. Yeah. And then we did, uh, you know. Our work period, yeah. and then we had retirement. Well, now why can't we just take all of those three phases and just scatter them around a lot more? Up. So we can mix them up. Yeah, yeah, do a bit of education here, yeah. then a little bit of retirement, a bit of work, yeah. then a little another bit of education. Yeah. And I think that that's just going to be increasingly what we kind of have to do to succeed in a world where there's so much change happening so quickly. Yeah. I mean, half the jobs that you know people, the graduates are doing today didn't exist ten years ago. Yeah. So you know, we have to be flexible, and that's that cognitive flexibility, which yeah. will become increasingly like the most important attribute yeah. you can have. And flexibility has to be hard to have in today's society, when, where you know, uh, well, namely, namely the governmental institutions that run you know education and educational policies, they need to see like statistics because they're not educators, so they look at it from like, okay, this is working or not working because of these statistics and the reality it seems is that education is more organic and you have to think on your feet, you have to be flexible, you have to make changes and that kind of um, goes against the grain definitely of, of the current system that's set up so um, which which makes uh, UnCollege uh, poised to be in a place uh, or already is in a place right now to make like a huge huge impact. Yeah and I think we'll see uh, tons of other um new approaches springing up and most of them will fail but yeah. you know in the process we will gradually do, maybe converge on you know a set of new solutions for education that don't exist yet mm -hmm. a lot of them will be online but not necessarily all of them some of them will be individually based uh, for example there's a great uh, new startup called pop expert which mm -hmm. um, just uh, actually just this week um, raised its first round of uh, angel funding 
and it, it's a great idea because it's all about you know individual people saying I'll teach you this online mm -hmm. and you then will sign you each person can sign up for a particular session with this particular person and have a video lesson direct live you know with that particular person it could be anything from meditation to guitar playing to politics whatever and I, I think you know this is uh, in, I love the, the kind of you know, nobody's no institution is sort of standing over these people saying this person can teach guitar yeah, you know, it's like yeah. if you trust this person to teach guitar and the price is right then you can hook up with them online and they can teach you and um, you know like people have been doing in the real world for ages with private tutors and stuff yeah. but it's, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to find someone who will teach you what you want to learn at the right price at the right level, someone you can get on with if you can meet them online and rather than just having to get someone who lives within a 10-15 mile radius Yeah, and plus you um, there's, you don't have to necessarily go to one specific building you know, to learn right. about this you know, the, the education is spread out. You can either learn online or you can drive to a person's house and the person will come to you or you can meet at a Starbucks and like study and discuss, you know, things there instead. Sure. So um, besides, uh, besides music, are there, uh, you know, with your ex experience, like, you know, working in university and, and being a DJ and working as a program director now at a college, is there um, any other subjects that musicians should uh, learn to hack, you know, besides the obvious musical subjects? That's a good question. Uh, I think these days uh, some kind of technology, you know, is useful for everyone, whether it's, you know, whether it's the, for, you know, so it's not just the obvious electronic musicians and DJs that I think uh, benefit from, you know, having some uh, technical programming coding kind of expertise but any kind of musician and anyone in any field because you can you know in, you can create websites where you can showcase your music you can use some of the new recording tools you can edit stuff down you can uh, so you can sell it online you can create videos um, music sharing websites are you know, increasingly great ways for example SoundCloud and yeah. all of these you know, or Reverb Nation yeah. These are fantastic uh, tools that, again, can you know, if you are uh, uh, playing a particularly uh, obscure kind of music, how do you find people? How do you find fans? You know, well, it's very difficult if you want to find them geographically. But again, you know, that's the wonder of the internet. If there's, you know, no matter how crazy your taste in music are, yeah. there's at least fifty other people in the world yeah. who have the same crazy taste, and you can find them online. So yeah. I think uh, I just thought of a couple it, bands came to mind <laughs> that are pretty, <laughs> they'd be pretty extreme, but they probably have way more fans than Fifty. But but, but no, I get it, it. Yeah, I mean it's it's this, I think though that there is this in some artists' mind. Hopefully, you know, fewer today, but in some artists' mind, there is still this sort of uh, a kind of distrust of modern technology, as if it's kind of somehow soulless and uh, yeah. you know taking the, the kind of the the feeling out of it uh, there's a friend of mine who she's a fantastic uh, interior designer mm -hmm. she's you know still only in mid 20s she's struggling she, she's getting beginning to get some clients now who are uh, paying her serious big, the first kind of serious money she's ever earned but she absolutely refuses to do CAD, you know, computer assisted design. Really? She absolutely refuses. She said, because she can draw. She can draw really well. And she says, well, look, if everybody starts doing CAD, you know, soon nobody will be left who can have any drawing skills. And then what happens if all the computers crash? Then we'll be absolute. No one will. And it's kind of like, well, well if that happens, that's what you're worrying we about. Can... We're all screwed anyway, yeah, right? There's nothing you can do. <laughs> like if if the internet went down, it would be a global crisis. There's nothing you can do, even if even if you had drawing skills, you can't save right. the entire. Right. I'm world. sure that if the computer, if the whole internet goes down, the fact that you've got drawing skills will yeah, not massively <laughs> help. Not, it's not your whole bit. The whole business you work for is based off of like the computer, so that you won't even be getting. You know, your business will go down. You won't have a place to work. But yeah, it's. I, I don't know. I think there. I feel like there's. I'm just gonna go off riff for a second, but I feel like there's definitely um, a lot of people who feel that the the purity of music only existed in the '60s and '70s. And yeah, I can understand. I, the biggest reasons I run this website 
this and this web show seeds of music is because of a lot of problems I see with music today in the industry but there's still good music coming out and embracing new technology is something that great musicians have always done I remember I know that people gave Pink Floyd crap for all of like the uh, synths that they were using because they said, oh, you're hiding behind your instrument. But no one says anything right. about Pink Floyd now. And the same for Hendrix. I mean, when he started working with uh, Marshall amplifiers and feedback and uh, it's just working with his guitar sound. I mean, that was working with new technology creatively. And, and I don't know, I, I think there's there's good music now and the technology is validated because technology has always evolved with music and you know side by side so I, right. that's i think it's just a question of being you know flexible again about yeah. things if you, if you are so if you if you can only do things with technology and then that's kind of a bit worrying but if you can't if you are so you know sort of resentful about technology that you will never even touch, uh, you refuse to even think about involving or using that in your creative work, then you know, that seems kind of equally dumb. Yeah. I mean, you see, you even see these kind of debates in DJs today. I mean, DJs like are essent quintessentially technical people, yeah. Yeah. and yet you still see, you know, even within DJs, you see people are arguing about, you know, whether... Uh, you know, it's really DJing when they were using a, a MIDI-based computer system rather yeah. than you know actual yeah. physical turntables. Uh, it, 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 when it comes down to it, all that matters is that you're getting the sound that you want. And if someone else doesn't like the way you get your sound, then I feel like that's kind of takes a back seat to the actual uh, emotion that you convey during your performance and what people get out of it. Like, do they or do people? Are people emotionally touched? That is, I don't think it really matters as much how you achieve that, unless that's like important to you in a very genuine way. Like you're not just bitter just because you feel like a ton of DJs are coming out now because MIDI triggers are cheap, you know, and it wasn't cheap right. for you, yeah. so you're angry, you know, because you yeah. spent so well, much I, money. I learned to beat match properly. These yeah. guys can't beat match. But now you know, they it's do like... it by a button, so I hate you. Yeah. You know, it's like that's exactly. they're... <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was like riffing. I was like, no, no, I told you, that's, just... that's cool. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I just think that's. A, I mean, look, I, I, I was, uh, and I, I love seeing people do things the hard way too. I mean, I was in San Francisco last week, uh, and I'm in this uh, small music store, electronic music store called, yeah. uh, I think it's what was it, um, Robot Speak uh, on Hate, uh, and it's absolute. It's a really cool store. The guy who runs it obviously makes virtually no money out of it, but he's just yeah. passionate about doing it. Yeah. So he keeps ticking along. And there was this live performance there on a Saturday afternoon, like 10, 15 people watching it, and it was just awesome. There was this guy who built this whole massive contraption. Um, I can fire you over a slide later, so a photo, so you can like put it on your site. Oh, but uh, he he had just built this whole really low tech kind of thing with lots of wires on it that he was plugging in and knobs that he was twisting, and and he made this whole like one hour long dance track from this crazy machine, and that was fantastic to see as well. So you know, I think it's just you know uh, it's whatever works for you as an artist is, yeah. is great so it's it's having the courage and the sort of confidence to to do whatever works for you i think and that's that's the spirit of again of hacking your education and of, and of being a kind of educational deviant if you like it's the same spirit there you go there you go that's a central element so um so i got uh so just some rapid fire questions that i'm going to sure. give it to you right now because only got a few minutes but um you know uh, what? What's one step? You know, if we got some musicians who uh, are guitarists or play different instruments, or maybe songwriters that are in their early twenties and they might not have taken that step into college. Uh, what's uh, one step that they could take right now to, uh, you know, basically start hacking their music education? Well, um, I I think one step would be to find some resource online that uh, they haven't uh, used yet um, and see if they could teach themselves something without going to any teachers or reading any books just by looking at some new online resource. I mean, you know, there's tons of stuff out there and probably most people have done this kind of already, but you can always learn more, I think. And never, um, 
not worrying that you know you don't know all the details. Just trying to, in the same way that you just, uh, you know, a lot of people when they get the furniture out of the box to assemble it, they don't read the instructions. They just have a go. You just yeah. try and you know see what works and not be worrying about well, I don't haven't mastered all the basic theory yet, so I'm going to wait until I've done that before I go on and start making music because you'll never <laughs> go anywhere with that attitude. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, you. Um, I've definitely hit a lot of robots and still trying to overcome those. But, uh, but this interview is is definitely helped me learn a lot, and it's going to help uh, anyone out there who's a independent artist or producer who's you know looking to take their music to the next level and uh, take their, you know, by taking their view of education to a different plane and, and accelerate that. So thanks for coming on, uh, Dylan. It's been really been a really I've always wanted to have an interview about like this where I can talk about uh, for the current state crisis, uh, I would say, of education. So thank you. Well, thanks for talking to me. It's been a pleasure chatting to you, Kyle. And, uh, you know, I really like what you're doing with your site. So good luck with everything. All right. Thank you. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. And that's it for another episode of Seeds of Music. Today on the show, we had the program director for uncollege.org, Dylan Evans, on the show talking about hacking your education. Uh, make sure to head over to uncollege.org and check them out. If you are uh, thinking about going to college and this really intrigues you, then go to their about. There's like an about flyout on their front uh, page. Just click on that. And then when the drop down menu comes out, click on their uncollege manifesto and download that and read it. That will really, really explain what Uncollege is about and academic deviance and hacking your education. It'll really give you a primer on what that's all about and you can get further connected and uh, hopefully that will help you uh, make an easier decision uh, on whether you're going to go to college for music or not. Um, also, if you haven't yet, sign up for the email newsletter. I say this a lot because it's so important. It's like the best, it's the best way for me to keep in touch with you and keep you updated on the latest interviews to Seeds of Music. Um, also, if you're watching from YouTube, subscribing to the YouTube channel isn't enough. Uh, you know, I, I don't send out messages through YouTube, so if there's an important update and I need to get in touch with you, uh, that's going to be on the, the email newsletter for the actual website. So head over to seedsmusic.net, sign up on one of the forums there. Uh, also, if you like this interview, uh, make sure to hit that like button and also share it on your platform of preference. Um, if you uh, know someone who's struggling with this question of, like, you know, oh my God, should I go to college and, you know, to get like a music degree or, you know, should I go to Berkeley and, you know, their parents are sweating bullets over how they're going to pay for that, then, you know, send them this interview uh, you know maybe you maybe really could be really really helping them out down the road in terms of saving them from uh, a lot of uh, debt and headache uh, also comment on the video what was your greatest takeaway from the interview I mean do you think do you think there's a, uh, an advantage to going to college now with the you know all the pro all the things that we talked about in the interview what how do you feel do you feel that college is, is still unnecessary, especially for uh, music. And are you going to apply what you've learned in this interview? Are you going to decide to hack your uh, your education? Uh, tell me in the comment section how you want to, one action that you're going to take today to start hacking your education. And lastly, is there anyone that you'd like to see interviewed? If so, send an email to me at kyle.seedsofmusic at gmail.com go straight to me and I'll answer right back and I appreciate it also if you want to be interviewed then just uh, let me know and send it to the same email so until next time I'd like to see you in the comments below on this video and also see you in the next interview